Welcome to the second episode of the Goals-Based Investing Podcast Series. I'm thrilled to be joined today by my good friend, Christine Gaze. Welcome, Christine. Thanks for having me, Tony. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, and this is a topic that you and I have been speaking about for quite some time. Um, in my book, I teased a little bit about you know the evolution of pricing and how I was anticipating over the next decade or so, we'd start to see a real change in the way that advisors uh, priced their business and their services. And you've actually done some terrific research on that. Why, why don't you share maybe kind of the high level findings and then maybe we'll get into that in greater detail. Absolutely. I, I really feel like I spent the entire year of 2021 studying uh, fees and uh, specifically fees related to financial planning. Uh, there were three really terrific research studies, uh, one by Kitsis, one by Bob Veras, and the third by um, Investnet Money Guide Pro that provided like a treasure trove of quantitative data. And then my company, Purpose Consulting Group, uh, did an overlay to that. We interviewed 43 advisors who were Financial planning was core to uh, what it is that they did, and they had a really high conviction in their fee model, whatever that fee model was. So just wanted to set the stage with sort of where we're getting these insights. Um, what I find fascinating when I look at a meta-analysis of quantitative uh, research studies, um, and there were three done in 2020, as I mentioned, that were really substantive uh, works, um, they converged around an average financial planning fee of $2,500. Um, and so it's great when you have quant studies and they actually agree on something when they're really divergent, you know, that tells you that, you know, there's something beneath the surface of the numbers, but here it was kind of clear. So $2,500, the average standalone uh, fee for financial planning, um, the average fee that an advisor charged on an hourly basis was about $250, and there was good convergence around those numbers. But what is really interesting, if you look at the trend over time, and a few of these studies did that, uh, while asset management fees, as you know very well, Tony, have been you know getting uh, compressed and compressed and compressed some more in the last decade or so, Financial planning fees have actually you know, been on the rise, and that's certainly contrary to the low inflationary environment we've been in. And again, I think this is such an important topic. And you know, you and I have been uh, students of the industry for a long time. Here, you know, we clearly evolved from a commission-based model to an asset-based fee model. And one of the things, again, that that I focus on in the book is I, I think that's good. We're certainly moving in the in the right direction. We're aligning uh, compensation to the performance of the portfolio. But if we want to change the value proposition of the advisor and we want to change the way that advisors think about what an advisor does, we're missing out on so much of it. And, you know, we're missing out on financial planning or estate planning or any sort of customized sort of research that's done on behalf of the client. I was struck by the numbers in your report where, again, I, I think the numbers are roughly 50-50 that people are actually charging and being compensated for financial planning, which is such a critical component of their value add. Absolutely. And I will say there's a lot of, I, I think there's a fair amount of noise in, in those numbers. Um, you know, Bob Varis and, and Michael Kitsis, well, they had a really high N in their studies. Um, they're getting their uh, research base from people who subscribe to, you know, their, their writings. And those are mainly people who are financial planning is core to their practice. I mean, I think 75% or thereabouts of Michael Kitsis's advisor base are CFPs versus 20 some odd percent of the broader market. So I, I will say um, that, it, so those were Varus's numbers. Um, I, I think if you look at the broader advisory base, um, there's maybe 20 to 30% of advisors are charging some sort of um, financial planning fee. Um, and that varies pretty widely if you look by channel. Um, so mm -hmm. only 10% of wirehouse advisors are, are charging a planning fee, according to you know, Veris's research, uh, versus about 60% um, of you know, RAAs. Now, part of that is due, as you know very well, to you know, more restrictive policies at the you know, wirehouses. But there's also a lot of really cool you know, innovation going on with pricing and fee models in the RAA space. 
if there's so much value outside of the portfolio and in in the report you cite something that uh john Ersessian and i spoke about in our last podcast series which is the the value of an advisor so much of that is is really based on becoming a behavioral coach it's not really the asset management component but yet our fees tend to be fixed to the asset management component um one of the things I cite in my book, and you know, again, I'm trying to anticipate where the business is going, is this great McKinsey report where they had said by 2030, you know, they imagine a Netflix type subscription pricing model. What type of fee models are we seeing? And is there any trend that gives us any guidance on where we think that's ultimately going to take us? I think so. So AUM, as as Michael Kitsis uh, writes, you know, still reigns uh, supreme. So that is the primary revenue model for the vast majority of advisors. Um, it, there is an hourly fee that some advisors charge, but I would say, you know, that's less than one percent of advisors are using an hourly fee as their primary revenue model. And then I, I, a way to think about it is, you know, taking this a uh, flat fee and breaking that out into one time or ongoing or recurring. And that is where there's some noise in that. I, so I would call that ongoing flat fee a subscription. Some people call it a retainer. Some people just call it a, a flat monthly or, you know, or quarterly fee. Um, so I think that is the arena where we're seeing, you know, a significant amount of growth um, and some innovation. But also, I'll say, especially among advisors who are that, you know, that 500 million plus the mega advisor group that I, you know, do that I study, you know, quite frequently. I'm seeing some real innovation there where AUM is their primary method of charging. They offer really deep financial planning in addition to professional investment management for their overall you know, um, fee. Uh, but many of them have introduced project-based fees um, as an entree for prospects into their practice. And, and there's... I think there is a growing discontent among high net worth investors um, related to an AUM model because so many people, and myself included, um, have, have entered into an AUM relationship with an advisor and received very little in the way of planning, analysis, or value um, in return. And so What's interesting, there are a number of advisors who, you know, her multi-billion dollar advisors, very successful practices, but had a growing flat fee business of clients who enter um, and pay a substantial fee to do a comprehensive financial plan. And guess what? Not surprisingly, the vast majority of those clients then migrate over to the AUM business. But what's happened is they've spent you know, six to 10 weeks with this advisor going through their um, their financial life, really opening the kimono, doing sophisticated planning. And in turn, they've gotten to understand the breadth and depth of the offering um, that that advisor has, and they've really built trust. So in that, in that case, they're much more willing to enter into an AUM relationship because they realize there's going to be some value exchange. Um you know, we had this sort of convenient sort of thing that we would talk about. My value proposition is outperforming the market, whether that's the right or the wrong metric. I think a lot of advisors did that. And therefore we gravitated to the AUM model and we kind of got stuck there. We've challenged advisors and so many advisors have really expanded their capabilities well beyond the portfolio. And again, the trust and estate and all the customized work in particular for high net worth clients, they're doing so much more beyond the portfolio and this is maybe your broader sort of perspective of, of looking at and studying the industry. Do you think it's a problem with advisors not articulating their value proposition, or maybe it's a combination where they can't quantify, you know, the, the whole Vanguard and investment study, which really focused on the same sort of thing, where's the value from an advisor come? It's not on the assets under management, it's behavioral coaching, it's all these other aspects. Is, is that a challenge for the industry? Is that something that we should be spending a little bit more time thinking through? Without a doubt, Tony. I, I mean, I think there, there are a lot of advisors that struggle to understand their own value. 
And if they don't understand it, then they're certainly not articulating it very well for clients. Um, And that's where these mega advisors who, I, I, I mean, who own and control the majority of client assets in the marketplace, regardless of what channel they're in, I, you know, I think have really made great strides. They largely charge by AUM, but they do um, a terrific job, many of them, of describing the holistic, you know, planning and value that they provide in their practice. So even though they charge by AUM, they package their offering as an integrated you know, financial and wealth, you know, planning and professional investment management. And they do that positioning up front. So clients don't feel like they're just paying for investment advice. They're just paying for risk management and asset allocation. Um, And so I, I think that in part, that's one of the reasons, and they've built out really sophisticated capabilities with regard to financial planning, many of them, in addition to having, you know, expert, you know, investment management professionals on the team, you know, also have estate planning expertise. They have people who can go deep on education planning or Roth conversions or sophisticated, you know, philanthropic planning and and needs. So lots of these firms have added, uh, you know, broad capabilities to um, financial and, and wealth planning and are able to handle more and more complex uh, needs, and and they are able to articulate it. Um, Mm -hmm. That's what I think advisors struggle with. And, you know, we just delivered a a financial planning training program called Planning with Purpose. And the whole goal was to improve the financial planning competency of advisors, but also help them really think through how it is they articulated their value and how they described their value for fees for clients. 19% of these advisors were confident describing their value for fees heading into the program and 75% were confident heading out of it. And I think the reason for that is because we forced them to think through What are you doing with regard to planning? How many hours are you spending on it? What is your process? What target market are you really focused on? And I think so many advisors, when they think about discussing planning with clients, they think about the script first. And I think you really have to start with the substance of your practice and the clarity of your offering. And when you do that, what you say about it, it comes from within. It's organic and it's authentic. And I think that's what people are looking for these days. I think you've hit on something really important. And that is that I do feel like some people think, you know, planning or just asking basic sort of questionnaires is very rude. And oh, by the way, a robot can do it. And oh, by the way, robots are doing it. And then there's the real planning. They're, they're listening to what clients are really feeling and thinking about and develop customized, highly customized solutions that can't be cookie cutter, can't be developed by a robot. So, so I think there's this, this tension that exists that even though the terminology sounds the, the same, right? A robo offering you know, professes to do the same sort of thing. They develop a financial plan. They develop a, an asset allocation model. They do rebalancing. They do tax loss harvesting. It all sounds very similar. But the reality is, you and I know, an advisor who does that really, really well, there's a huge premium. There's a huge premium in in just, you know, the market environment, protecting clients from themselves and making these emotional decisions. But it's also hearing things that a robot isn't going to pick up on. So that trained ear and eye to see and hear things that maybe um, these cookie cutter solutions aren't really getting at. I think are really a big part of the advisor's value proposition. And I would challenge them to lean into it rather than lean back away from it. And I I think some people think, well, that's kind of cookie cutter. Anyone can do that. Clients are paying for advice. And uh, I I think there is an increasing willingness to, you know, to pay for financial advice and increasing knowledge among the general public uh, that they need help you know, planning. Interesting insights from Bob Veris's work with regard to, he looked at um, AUM in the, or not AUM, um, LOS in the business. And what he found was that those with one to five years experience in the business are much more likely to charge for a financial plan 
than those that aren't. Um, and so they're not shackled to sort of the, you know, the AUM model of, of old. They're coming into this with fresh eyes and many of them are coming into it credentialed uh, with their CFP as well. So they, you know, they have foundational knowledge and, and are, are, are perhaps therefore able to articulate their value a little better than those who've just cobbled together, you know, planning knowledge over time. Christine, this has been fantastic. Uh, we'll, we'll have to do this again. Uh, I will also remind everyone of the work that you and I both do with the Investment and Wealth Institute in providing a lot of the education on the value of planning, you know, this, this, this constantly evolving value proposition that advisors um, really need to put front and center with their client engagement, because I think, as you and I know, when you certainly spoke to it so eloquently today, an advisor is so much more than the portfolio. And a, a good advisor is going to help clients to achieve their goals, dreams, and aspirations. And a robot is likely going to fall a little bit short because they're not going to pick up on these cues that you and I and others have been trained to identify. So, Christine, thank you so much. And I look forward to having you back again so we can dig a little deeper. Thanks so much, Tony.